Welcome to this month's Ask Me Anything video. Each month, a few friends and I get together and answer the most pressing questions from our audiences on a specific topic. I hope you enjoy this month's offering. Welcome to this month's Ask Me Anything. Today we're going to talk about, or we're going to answer your questions about growing herbs. Be sure to check out the show notes for some freebies from us. I'm Indy from Our Inspired Roots. I teach people how to homestead for better health. Shelly and Christy, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Shelly with Rock and W Homestead. I teach people how to garden in small spaces and preserve their food. I'm Christy with Stone Family Farmstead, and I teach people things like canning, gardening, and homestead planning at a beginner level. Great. Okay, let's jump into our first question, and that would be Christy's question. Okay, so that question is, I can't seem to keep rosemary alive. In our old house, it was so easy to grow, so can you tell me how to grow them? Maybe I'll catch what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so rosemary is a really hardy um, perennial plant, and it's really um, grows really well in zones eight and above. In zone seven and below, you're going to need to either plant it in a pot and bring it inside to overwinter, or you can uh, plant it against a south-facing wall, or you can also mulch it to keep roots moist in summer or warm in winter. And depending upon what your um, temperature is there, you're going to want to um, decide whether or not mulching is the best idea. Um, to plant it in the ground, you're going to want to work composted manure into the ground and then plant it there. Give it about two to three feet um, space and then full sun with a pH of six to seven. It needs a light, well-drained soil, or if you're planting in a container, a lightweight soil mix. Um, the pests that you would maybe face with rosemary are whiteflies, spider mites, mealybugs, scale, or um, in the case of mine, um, spittle bugs. And Shelly's going to talk about that right now. So the question that was asked is, they have a huge rosemary plant that grows well, but it looks like someone has gone and spit all over it. What could this be? And that is actually a spittle bug. It is um, a soft-bodied insect that sucks sap from new growth on herbs and per, uh, herbaceous perennials. And it is not really, it doesn't really harm your plant. It won't kill it by doing that. It makes that spit because it's soft-bodied. It makes that spit to protect itself from predators, from extremes of heat, so it's a heat regulating, and then it also keeps it from drying out since it doesn't have a hard body. The best way to get rid of it is just to knock it off with a, a hard stream of water, and that will just take it off of there. If you have a plant that's completely overtaken by it, you could use an insecticidal spray, a natural spray, like we've talked about before with um, hot peppers or garlic. But for the most part, it's not going to harm your plant at all. Just knock it off of there and get going. It's common, like I said, in rosemary, roses, strawberries, herbs, and that's it. Don't worry about it. Just get it off of there. Next is Mindy. Okay. The next question is, what are the easiest herbs to grow or overwinter indoors? So the short answer is that you can grow, most herbs can be grown indoors. Uh, and some can be overwintered uh, and it really just it just matters you know what your house would the humidity in your house house the um the light source in your house so and this is something that will come up a lot <laughs> today is that it's really just a trial and error thing but to be more specific um, perennials tend to do well indoors they um, like mint, oregano, thyme, and then rosemary and sage can also do well indoors and they can overwinter. Annuals like basil, parsley, and cilantro can grow indoors, but they don't overwinter as well. And I think that the reason for that is that it's just normally have a dormant period for annuals is that they die completely back. Uh, and keep trying to keep them alive at the same temperature for a, an entire year or more can just put a lot of stress on the plant. So um, in my experience, 
I don't try to keep plants overwintered for more than uh, one or two years because the plant gets a little bit sickly. So I'll replace the plant. Some people will actually create a dormant period for their plant. So they'll put it into a dark closet or something like that. So you could try that too. Um, but my advice for which herbs to choose would be, I like to grow basil, sage, um, thyme, and mint, all of those things work really well for me. Uh, but you know, that depends on it, on your location too. And we were talking about humidity earlier, which makes a big difference too. If you, um, like we were, we were saying, when you have a wood stove, it dries out the air a lot. So you usually will put more moisture into the air, but if you have other heat sources that can change the moisture in your house too. So it's, it's really just, um, figuring out what works for you. And the next question is Christy. So, okay, this question is about dill and cilantro. My dill and cilantro are three feet tall and flowering. I'm not sure when to harvest or cut it back. It's the first time since it's ever grown for me, and I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. So if you're in Dallas-Fort Worth, you're probably in zone 8A, which um, is going to get about a 10 to 15 degrees uh, low, lowest. And so um, being that these two plants are both, um, they're annuals and they are cold winter crops where, or cold crops where you live and also where I live, um, here's the thing about annuals is that their life cycle is basically going to be sprouting, flowering, seeding or going to seed and then dying back and so there's not going to be any cutting for it to come back later it's not that kind of a plant and so um, basically what is going to happen is um, right now you're seeing your plant in the seeding stage where it's it's going to set some seeds and so you can either leave the plants alone and let them reseed themselves if you like that area where they're at if you don't like that area you can um, collect the seeds, which I'll tell you how to do later. Um, but for harvesting time, um, the way that you would do that is you would do it before it co goes to flower, cilantro when it's low to the ground, kind of in a little bush, and, um, and dill be when it has more than five um, leaves on it. So um, you can take for cilantro take the whole leaf stock off if you want and then just bring it inside and you know pull the leaves off or you can do that right there at your plant and for dill you can um, just snip the leaves off there or if you have a few dill plants you can just take the whole stock inside and dry it or whatever it is you want to do use it um, if you want to collect the seeds those um, grow on a stem that has a whole bunch of other little stems with clusters of seeds and so basically for both plants you're going to wait until those are the seeds pods are all brown and then you can cut them off and if you want to if you want to hang them upside down just put them in a in a paper bag and let uh, the paper bag catch the seeds and if you don't want to do that like I don't want to do that I usually just put a cookie sheet out on my counter and just let them all sit on there let them dry for a while and then just package them up and um, you know put the date on the package so I know when I harvested them so that's pretty much it really uh, next question is Shelly's this person says when I was a kid my mom always had a bed of parsley growing a couple times a year she would cut it back and it would come back up prettier than ever. I don't remember not having to, re I don't remember her having to replant parsley over and over each year, but where she lives, she has to replant it twice a year because it bolts too fast. Why am I having this problem? So Christy was just talking about annuals, but parsley is different. It's a biennial, meaning that the first year it will come up with lots of lush green foliage that you can cut and dry and use and then the second year it comes up again it'll die down in the winter and then it'll come up again in the spring and then it will give you a few leaves but then it will set seed so it has that a different cycle than an annual um, since it's a cool weather crop it's going to bolt as soon as you get any kind of heat going in your in your garden and that's probably what you're seeing so what you probably was happening with your mom is that 
she, you didn't realize that she had plants in different stages. So she had some, she let hers go to seed where they were. So there was always new ones coming up. And then they were in, she had a bed of first year and second year plants growing at the same time. So they appeared to always be perennial plants because she had that cycle going all the time. And so that's what you want to try to do, mimic that. So you've got some going to seed and some starting each year. And it'll just, you can accomplish that in two years. Let those go to seed, start some new ones and, and keep the cycle going. And Mindy has the next question. Okay. <clears throat> What is the best way to keep indoor herbs healthy if you don't have a good sunny window to keep them in? So if you don't have any sun at all, you're going to need a grow light. I like to use an LED light because um, it's, it costs a little more upfront to buy it, but it's in the long run costs less to run. And I also just like the way that the light is. Um, mine's actually pink, but uh, I just like it a lot better than fluorescent light. Uh, and it also has lower... Um, electromagnetic fields so if that's something that you're concerned about that's always a plus with LEDs but if you don't want to get a grow, grow light you don't want to run it you can also just try herbs that like indirect light uh, mint and aloe are my two favorite for that but you can also try thyme cilantro parsley or tarragon um, and again it's just going to depend on your location what's going to work for you but those are ones to start with uh, and the next question Christy's going to introduce, we're all going to talk a little. Yeah, so um, let's talk about how different annuals do in different areas of the United States. Since all three of us are in different climates, um, the plants are going to behave a little bit differently everywhere. So let's go ahead and start with Mindy. Okay, um, well, this is my first year growing in Virginia. So I don't know a ton about it here, but in New Hampshire, um, it is kind of interesting because a lot of a lot of plants that are perennials other places are annuals in New Hampshire just because it's so cold. So um, you just have to be aware of what's going to grow in your location. For example, with parsley, I didn't realize that other people consider it a cold weather um, crop, but now actually it makes sense because we can we could plant it before the last frost date up there. But um, so. It's really just, you know, having, having to take a look at what people are doing in your area and um, figuring out what's going to work for you. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, for your area. Shelly? <laughs> well, I live in Central Texas. I've been here for five years, and before that I lived in Oregon. And I, I went from Zone 8B in Oregon to Zone 8B in Texas, and I thought that they were going to be the same, that I was just going to be able to come to Texas and grow everything just like I did in Oregon. But nothing could be farther from the truth. It's completely different. The reason it's so different is because it's warm and humid here, even though it's the same zone. And so I also have to pay attention to how hot it's going to be and so all of my annuals, like parsley and cilantro and dill, they will all on the web. go to seed. <laughs> no, no, no talking. They will all go to seed as soon as it gets it, any kind of hot around here. So I have to plant those in the fall, which is my cool weather crop time. So while the rest of the of the country is planting their spring crops of cool weather crops, mine are in the fall and. I didn't learn that until I got here and I tried it my way and then I learned that it's completely different. So I would suggest another way to, is to go find a master gardener in your area, find a, a master gardener club, or um, especially find a book that is specific to your area because you don't know what you don't know about ha uh, the climate in your area. I think Chrissy's going to talk about microclimate. Yeah, so when we're new to gardening and even when we are pretty seasoned we can look around online for the information that we need about our zone but it's really going to come down to um, understanding that the zone information that we get is going to be very very general and so that can give us kind of a direction to go. So for me, you know, it would say parsley should be planted in um, spring, like early spring. But for me, because we get really high kind of volatile temperatures in the summer, that means that I have like this teeny tiny little window to get some parsley or cilantro or whatever. So um, 
because of the temperatures that we have, um, I would probably be more inclined now to um, either plant a transplant which is what I did this year in January, and my parsley is doing really well. But if I was going to plant from seed, I'd probably do that in the fall and then just let it overwinter and then just try to collect as much as I could before the temperatures get, um, get high enough to cause it to bolt that or any herb that I'm planting. So also another thing to know is that um, you have your, your zone and then you have your climate where you live. Um, and that can be really different from city to city. And then you also have a microclimate inside of your yard. So if you have like a shaded area, um, if you have a shaded area, maybe you're going to be able to grow some things versus um, in a sunny area where you wouldn't be able to. So every yard has like a few different microclimates. And so you're going to have to just try different things in different places. Um, and just understand that all the information that you're getting online or from books or whatever, even from books that are specific to your area, are going to have just very general information and not necessarily information that is completely and totally tailored to your, um, your microclimate in your yard. Can I ask you guys a question? Do you have wind that comes from a certain area like here if the winds are coming from the south you can always expect it to be very hot and humid and if they come from the north it's going to be cold do you have that same sort of thing where um, you pay attention to how the how the wind is coming into your garden and how it's going to affect your plants um in new hampshire we had a little bit of that like if the wind came from the north it was usually bringing lots of cold from canada um but not so much like related to gardening though. So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, cause I was thinking about that microclimate that she said, even the way you have a fence in your yard and how like in my area, when this, when it comes from the South, if I want to protect that, uh, I, I would want to put a fence up on the North side. So it would keep the North wind from hitting my, my garden because the yeah. North wind is always cold wind here. So that would, that's another way that I would look at my microclimate here in Texas. Yeah, a lot of people would plant trees on the north side of their property. So that actually makes sense to me yeah. um, to block the cold wind. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes if a, like a tree isn't doing well or something like that, Todd has done things like put up fences and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but not necessarily for temperature reasons. Yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, for this topic, it's, it's interesting because, um, like, I was talking to a friend once, and she was asking me of gardening things, and she seemed a little bit like she was upset that she didn't know what she was doing, and I said, it, gardening is really just a thing that you learn as you go, like, no matter how many books you read, how many whatevers you read online, you have to just figure it out, especially in your specific location. And she, made, I think it made her feel better. She was like, oh, okay, so I'm not just, you know, <laughs> not knowing what I'm doing. Right. So that's why people love gardening so much, right? Because it's a challenge. There's always some new thing to learn and some, some new thing to keep you going. New right. plant to grow. Yeah, I always talk about it when I do... Um what I teach on it or whatever, you know, that um, it's really kind of an intuitive thing, you know, it's not really something that you can learn. It's not like math, you know what I mean? It's, it's something that's intuitive and you have to, um, you eventually will be able to understand that when you look at a plant, what's wrong or what it needs or whatever, but generally speaking, you know, um, the information you get is just going to be just that. And Shelly has our next question. So well, this is from someone who just bought a new place last fall and she noticed that there were a lot of grasshoppers, some as big as three inches, and I can relate to that. We have that big of grasshoppers here in Texas. She says, I have a garden as well as an herb garden that I know the grasshoppers are going to go after. I haven't seen anything on getting rid of grasshoppers. Any suggestions? So uh, the short answer is you need to make the plants not taste good for, for the grasshoppers. And you can do that by making a uh, a spray with um, 
And you can do that by making a spray with garlic and peppers. You can find out, we talked about that in detail in Ask Me Anything number one at time code three minutes, 25 seconds. So go over there to get the specifics about that. The other thing that you should do is make your garden friendly for birds because the birds will come in and they'll eat the grasshoppers. And what you wanna do is cut down on the amount you have as quickly as you can. Get, get rid of them as quickly as you can, and then they won't m multiply as much, and birds are the, one of the best ways to do that. And Christy, or Mindy, has our final question. Um, when growing herbs indoors in small pots, how do I best fertilize them and keep them alive? So with small pots, you have two main challenges. One is that there's just not enough um, bulk to feed the plant, so there's not as much organic matter and then the other thing is that they dry out really quickly. So my suggestion would be to get some compost tea and actually just water your, your herbs every day with that. Um, and also try to put them in a slightly bigger uh, container if you can, just because like you might actually have to water them twice a day depending on how small the, the pot is. So um, that would be my recommendation is compost tea. You could also do manure tea, but um, I was reading about this recently and I'm not going to remember all the details, but I think there's something about manure that, that can, um, I think it's like it messes with the pH a little bit. I'm not sure, mm. but compost tea seems to be better if you can get that. Uh, so that's my recommendation for that. And that was the last question. So um, thank you for watching and don't forget to grab our freebies and to follow us on social media and that all of that is in the show notes. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family. And if you would like to get the updates each month for whenever we release these AMA videos, subscribe to my channel and if you want to find me on social media, you can find me all over the place at Stone Family Farmstead and at my blog at stonefamilyfarmstead.com.